At 0913 a.m. on April 10, 1963, the nuclear-powered USS Thresher, also known as SSN 593, met its harrowing end, resulting in the most devastating submarine catastrophe ever recorded. In this tragic incident, the USS Thresher, identified as SSN 593, sank, leading to the tragic loss of 129 lives, including crew members and civilians. This event remains the deadliest submarine disaster in U.S. history, occurring during a deep diving test about 220 miles off Cape Cod near Boston, Massachusetts. To date, it is recognized as the most severe submarine disaster worldwide. Launched in July 1960, the Thresher SSN-593 marked a new era in submarine technology, boasting unprecedented quietness and deeper diving capabilities than any of its forerunners. Known as the most advanced attack submarine of its era, the USS Thresher was designed for speed, stealth, and the ability to dive deeper than any other submarine, with a primary mission to track and destroy Soviet submarines. It played an essential role in detecting remote submarines and ships and was expected to spearhead the U.S. Navy's anti-submarine missile program. The Portsmouth Naval Shipyard was awarded the construction contract for the USS Thresher on January 15, 1958. Following its launch in July 1960, the submarine underwent rigorous sea trials in the Western Atlantic and Caribbean from 1961 to 1962, testing its state-of-the-art technology and armaments. It took part in several exercises off the U.S. northeastern coast, including a notable trial from September 18 to 20, 1961. During a trial on November 2, 1961, while en route to Puerto Rico, the Thresher's reactor was shut down and a diesel generator was used to maintain electrical power. Hours later, when the generator malfunctioned, the submarine's battery had to support the load. The captain initiated a reactor restart, but the battery was exhausted before full operation, leading to internal temperatures soaring to 60 degrees Celsius and necessitating evacuation. The Kavala submarine provided emergency power to assist in reactivating the Thresher's reactor. After several more trials, the Thresher returned to Portsmouth on November 20, 1961. Before returning to the Portsmouth shipyard on July 16, 1962, the USS Thresher underwent further testing. At the shipyard, a comprehensive inspection was conducted for system repairs and adjustments, a process that spanned nearly nine months. Remarkably, none of the repairs raised significant concerns. During this time, the Thresher carried out routine inspections, uninterrupted streaming, final tuning, and testing, all as part of the preparations for the upcoming sea trials. This stage was crucial for the ship's readiness prior to setting out to sea. Additionally, while docked, the crew underwent thorough training and integration in preparation for their departure. On April 8, 1963, the ship set sail for sea trials, marking its first departure from the shipyard in nine months. The submarine rescue ship Skylark, part of Submarine Squadron 10 based in New London, joined to meet the Thresher. Their objective was to conduct diving tests east of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Together, the two vessels traveled to a designated area off Boston, where the Thresher was slated to perform its initial trim dive and a half-test deep dive. That afternoon, the Thresher conducted a preliminary trim dive, resurfaced, and then undertook a second dive to half-test depth. The submarine stayed submerged overnight, re-establishing underwater communication with Skylark at 06.30 a.m. on April 10th in preparation for the deep dive trials. Adhering to standard procedures, the Thresher descended gradually, orbiting under Skylark to maintain communication. At every additional 100 feet of depth, the submarine paused to verify the integrity of its systems. As the Thresher neared its test depth, Skylark received a garbled communication, indicating minor issues. Have positive up angle, attempting to blow. Shortly thereafter, another unclear message was intercepted mentioning the number 900. Initially, these muddled transmissions were thought to be due to the thresher blowing air into its ballast tanks, a common occurrence when passing through thermal layers or encountering turbulence. Such interruptions in communication were not typically cause for alarm. Skylark, 
tasked with ensuring the dive area was secure for the thresher's safe surfacing, attempted to inform the submarine that surfacing was an option if needed. In emergencies, submarines are quickly updated about surface conditions. Despite multiple attempts to reach the thresher, no response was received. The captain of Skylark transmitted the message three additional times, but silence persisted. Hours later, a distorted message from the thresher at its test depth was intercepted. The thresher wasn't visible on the surface and concern escalated when Skylark ceased receiving communications from the submarine. It gradually became apparent to those on the surface that the thresher had sunk. Having lost contact, Skylark's commanding officer dispatched emergency signals and commenced an intensive search operation. The message detailing the Thresher's disappearance and presumed loss was relayed to the commander of Submarine Squadron 2 in New London by noon. Naval bases along the East Coast were instructed to deploy forces for search and rescue efforts. The USS Seawolf SSN-575 and USS Sunbird ASR-15 were diverted from their usual missions to aid in the search for the Thresher. Broadcast messages across the submarine fleet urged the Thresher to re-establish communication. By 6.30 p.m. that day, following an unsuccessful search, the commander of the submarine force Atlantic ordered the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard to start informing the next of kin and families of those aboard the Thresher, beginning with the captain's wife. The message delivered the somber news that the Thresher was missing and presumed lost. With no response to communications from Skylark and the standard surfacing report time elapsed, all hope faded by 5 o'clock p.m. The USS Recovery ARS-43 reached the incident site and found an oil slick near the Thresher's last known position. Task Group 89.7, led by Rear Admiral Ramage and designated by the Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Atlantic Fleet, concluded by 10 p.m. that there were no survivors and that the Thresher had sunk in waters exceeding 1,300 fathoms. The recovery of ample debris indicated a major accident. Despite exhaustive searches, the Thresher was officially declared missing. President John F. Kennedy was informed, leading him to order flags nationwide to be flown at half-staff. The task group's objective was to locate the sunken submarine to examine its hull through underwater photography and other methods, aiming to identify the primary cause of the loss. The rescue force, equipped comparably to specialized oceanographic research vessels, conducted thorough visual, photometer, and sonar surveys around the Thresher's last known coordinates. After collecting sufficient debris from the Thresher over a series of dives, the search was concluded on September 7, 1963. The Navy undertook an extensive investigation, including a comprehensive inquiry, to ascertain the cause behind the Thresher tragedy. The investigation concluded that the likely cause of the incident was extensive flooding in the engine room. This flooding was believed to have been caused by the failure of silver-based solder joints in the piping system, which led to water compromising the ship's electrical system. This, in turn, resulted in the shutdown of the nuclear reactor, a process known as a scram. The thresher tried to surface by blowing its ballast tanks. However, the investigation suggested that ice formation in these tanks, a consequence of the frigid depths, might have hindered this critical emergency process. If you're passionate about uncovering the depths of history and exploring more intriguing stories like the one we've shared today, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Join our community to dive deeper into the fascinating tales of the past with our upcoming content.